agencies, other state organizations that could be helping you, okay? Once again, my name is Margaret Wigger Jacobs. I'm the director of the Learning Institute and the Resource and Referral Office here at Coco Kids, which is the um, r and the resource and referral for the county of Contra Costa. And up there in the top corner, for me anyway, is Kim Nguyen, who is our uh, Quality Matters uh, facilitator and our SIPT trainer in our program, uh, scheduling our trainings and workshops and things like that. And she is our IT help today. To my other side is Joan Means, who is longtime early childhood consultant now for many different things. Um, and she's our facilitator today and will be helping track the questions and sometimes helping us put our, our questions into words. She hears from you all um, outside of these meetings too. So I appreciate that when Joan brings the questions. And then next is Michelle DiMaggio from the County Health Department. She is gonna be helping us with our technical questions. What has happened since last we got together? Um, a lot happens and a lot is going to be happening. So she's going to keep us informed. So you have submitted questions. A lot of your questions this time were about immunization, about the vaccine rather. And um, Michelle does not have all those answers today, but she's going to try to get more for us in the future. But I know some of you have some personal experience about what's going on with your vaccine um, stories. So um, we're going to get to those. You can be, always be putting questions in. And Joan and, Mich and Kim are going to be trying to keep track of those questions. But meantime, um, I'm going to ask Michelle to go ahead and talk to us about what, to, uh, what we should be doing in the child care field. OK, thank you so much, Michelle. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, Happy New Year. I'm going to be joined today by my uh, current manager, uh, Deborah Patterson, uh, to help answer some of your questions. Uh, last meeting, I think, when was that? In September, I think, or October was our last meeting. And uh, you had some really good questions overall and what to do in regards to COVID and daycare. Not much has changed. Um, Everything is pretty much the same. Looking for, I, I think there was a question about mask requirements for children. I have not seen any uh, new information from CDC. Um, I asked also our other manager who's on our schools program and uh, he has not uh, also uh, received any new information about that. Um, I don't have a presentation today. Well, I was hoping today to be informal, basically do a and a uh, but one of the new updates, as you may have heard, is the uh, quarantine time. And I'm going to share my screen for uh, just a minute, if I can. Uh, give me one minute. Can you see my screen? It should have a grid on it. Yes. Oh, good. So uh, contact to uh, COVID-19, no symptoms, and contact to COVID with symptoms. This uh, basically is quarantine. So anybody who has been in contact with a COVID positive person within six feet for about 15 minutes in the cumulative time of 24 hours, uh, that person is considered a close contact. It used to be 14 days quarantine time. Now it's 10 days. However, at the 11th day return date, if you, if you um, have in your guidance that they may return to work on the 11th day, you still have to monitor their symptoms for 14 days because that person from 11 to 14 days can still uh, experience symptoms. They may be a late bloomer, for, exa for ex example, in their uh, symptomology. So again, a close contact has to be quarantined, stay at home, stay, uh, take care of themselves, monitor for symptoms for 10 days. If you choose on the 11th day, they can return to work, but still monitoring their symptoms. So it's that relationship with your, um, with your teachers and your instructors, your teachers and your children, your parents to make sure that they monitor their symptoms. And then um, 14 days, 
it would be over. Uh, but I would recommend still monitoring. I also would recommend that between the seventh and 10 day, that they also uh, go get tested. We have about uh, 10 uh, Contra Costa Health Services sites where you can get the COVID tested. Um, you can go onto our website and make an appointment. Um, they're kind of switching out a little bit. As I mentioned, vaccinations, we are trying to trying to increase our vaccinations to the public. Um, but if you need information on where to get tested, please let me know um, and also go to our website. Okay, any questions about the quor qu uh, new quarantine? Yes, Michelle, yes. this is Ivana. Hi. Um, we have a teacher that requested to go home today because she was told that the son, um, no, the father of the children that she was taking care of last a night who are the he, her grandchildren okay. was told that she he had been in close contact with a person that was infected okay so was that a, a right decision to send her home or could she had been in school and no problem so it sounds like she is probably a third or fourth contact oh, yes yeah fourth. so she can be at work um, the father is the close contact. So the right. father would be this information here, and, he, and he's not an, a teacher. So no. Um, no, so sh for her, she's not a close contact, but I would still recommend um, monitoring, tell her to monitor her symptoms, uh, possibly get tested just to be sure. Yeah, that's what I had requested, and I asked her to go home till next Tuesday. Oh, okay. So you put her on quarantine just to be safe? Yes. Okay. But okay. I just wanted to know, you know, how many um, state, I mean, not, but spaces between the person that is infected, the second person that was in charge, the third, the fourth. So what do you advise? The third and fourth. So you yeah. have, you have your close contact. Yes. They have to stay home for 10 days. Right. I mean, excuse me, you have your COVID positive, isolate for 10 days. Then you have your close contact quarantine for four days so that's one and two three and on monitor their symptoms recommend testing thank you Michelle. that was well and i have to say that for a uh, daycare and i wanted to start off this you guys have been really really good <laughs> i've worked with different types of workplaces over the last i don't know six to eight months or so and um you have been on it you've been cautious you've been careful um, and I really applaud you for that. Uh, thank you. From, thank from you. Public Health. Yeah. Brenda, I have a question also. Yes. Um, wow. We have a parent who um, is positive. Her children are not. She's not able to isolate away from them. So I'm, I've told her 24 days for the kids. That's correct, right? Her 14 days and another 10 or 10 days and another 14. So the parent is the COVID positive. Yes. And her children are the close contacts. Yes. So now it's 10 days. So, but they're still with her right now during this time. So it's, it's a, they have to have the 14 days of hers. Like they're going to be with her this whole time that she's supposed to be quarantining. So their, their last day of contact with a positive person is, is still, is still ongoing. That's what my concern is. Uh, and you would do uh, since they're both living to get together. And Debbie, hop in if you uh, if you have can, anything. Can you hear me, Michelle? Can I hear you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good. That's fine. Keep going. I just wanted. To make sure. <laughs> yeah, we hear you. <laughs> so that's Debbie, my uh, manager, and uh, she's going to uh, co-present with me today. Um, but you take well. Obviously, they're living with their parents, so they're all, they're probably going to be on the same ten day quarantine. Ten day quarantine. Um, then you add the three extra days, 11, 12, 13, 4, oh, 4, 11, 14 days for monitoring. Um, okay. Yeah. So they don't have to worry about doing, I was, I was being overly cautious maybe in doing a 10 days after the mom was no longer quarantine herself because they're in constant contact with her. So they are constantly being exposed to her. Right. That's correct. Yeah, it's really an additional 10 days Thank you. after her symptoms are improving and she hasn't had a fever for okay, so no. hours, then it's 10 days after that, the kids need to quarantine. Okay, Thank perfect. You. So that's how I understood it. So I basically told her about 24 days, correct. 14 plus 10. 
Well, it's really 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, plus 10, 10. and then watch okay. for four more days. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we, we had this Dorothy Stewart from old firehouse school. So we just had a oh. case where a uh, staff member uh, was in close contact with somebody that had COVID and she didn't test positive until 15 days afterwards. Oh. So she came to school one day <laughs> so, and we had to shut down the room, maybe, you know, because we thought she'd be okay. So uh, my guess is it happened like Brenda was thinking that somebody else in her family got it first and then she got it from them. So anyway, that's a cautionary or, tale. <laughs> yeah, or she was asymptomatic uh, the whole well, time. Yeah, 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 she was she was asymptomatic or somebody's yeah. asymptomatic in the family. But anyway, it, so, it, so it was the 15th day after her exposure that she tested positive. Yeah, and that's what I'm reading about 40% of the population are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge population amount. Yeah. yeah. Um, Debbie, anything you want to add? I have a question. Oh, yes, go ahead, please. Um, and I don't know if it's, uh, maybe it's a question, but um, also kind of because I'm a little confused. Um, my school is in Contra Costa County. One of our teachers ended up testing positive. Contra Costa County said that um, the parents of the kids that were in the room those siblings can still attend the preschool that we have attached to the infant center. Um, but then Solana and, and said that they're okay to come to the school, right? So that those kids do not have to quarantine and neither does the teacher of the parent that's in the class of the infant center where the outbreak happened, right? But then for myself, I live in Solano County and I received a call for Solano County and they told me that my entire household has to quarantine and my mother couldn't even go to the store. So I'm confused because if my entire family cannot leave the house, mm -hmm. how is it possible that um, a sibling or a mother of a student that is in close contact with a positive person can still attend school or still uh, work. It does. It doesn't make sense to me. Right. Debbie, you want this one? You want me to answer this well, one? That one was confusing, but um, I'm sorry. I know, and I'm probably all, all over the place with it. Should I read? Should I? Read? Yeah. Let me see if. Let me see if I got it. So um, you have a parent, and all of her children attend your daycare. And um, the person, either the case investigator or contact tracer, um, do you know which one they spoke to? Um, in Contra Costa, it's Jennifer. Okay. So that person informed you in particular? Yes. Okay. That the parent should stay home, but her, ch that her children can attend the school. Is that correct? Correct. So we have an infant center and a preschool. In the infant center is where the teacher um, tested positive. Okay. And there's a child that's in that room. That child has the mother and sibling that are in the preschool. Okay, so, so, she says, so they're saying that the mother can still work in the preschool and the child in the preschool can still attend preschool. And the yeah. mother's the one that's COVID positive, right? Well, no, the child in the infant center is the COVID is the one that's um, close contact. Okay, so see, she's that's the only contact is the child that the teacher. Right, the baby. To. Yeah, but the mother and sibling are not a contact to that teacher, so they can continue on go to work, go to school, but the child needs to quarantine. I get that, but then Solano County is saying my entire family has to stay home and quarantine. You, are you the positive teacher? No, I was in close contact. So you're a contact, so no. So that it's the same not, situation. Yeah, not correct. You, only you have, have to quarantine and your family does not. I, you know, I think everybody should be on the lookout, of course, for any symptoms, but no, you are the only one who needs to quarantine. So I think that um, when I was listening to when we first started, like any concerns or whatever, I think this is an issue like, if counties are telling different information, it's confusing to me because I do have some families that live in Solano County 
and I have families that live in Contra Costa County, but we're receiving different information and I don't know what to send out to my parents. Can the kids come? Can they not come? I don't know. Yes. I know. I have a headache too. <laughs> we can't answer for Solano County. Um, um, we all are it's basically the same CDC guidance for close contact. Uh, CDC does have a, quite a few pages, but one particular in, uh, page in general. And so, and CD, CDPH, California Department of Public Health, also creates uh, guidance for local health departments to follow. Um, so it's it's the same guidance. Um, I'm not sure on their interpretation. Okay. It might be extra cautious. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. we are we know we're correct. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to take this off of the screen. Okay, and I see everybody now. Um, so the, the topic of close contacts, I'm going to send this out um, to everybody after our presentation, but any other questions in particular about the new guidance for the 10 day uh, quarantine? Okay. Um, secondly, uh, sorry, Michelle. Yes, uh, Silvana. Sorry, this is, yes, this is Silvana. Hi. Um, I have two individuals, two staff members that went to Mexico, mm -hmm. and they came back last Saturday. Mm -hmm. So they have to be ten days. Uh, we requested ten days with a negative test result. Is that okay? That's okay. So uh, CDPH uh, uh, provided a travel advisory. And the pertinent wording there is the should and highly recommended. So you can go stricter and you did that. So that was a, uh, an advisory um, and that's a guidance. That's a, the, the step you take was a good step just for precautionary. Thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, let's move on with some of the questions that we had. Um, I don't have those available. If you want to maybe read them off one by one. I can do that. Okay. Um, and again, many of these are about the vaccine. So uh, if, if you can't answer or partially answer, we'll understand. So the first question that came in is what can you tell us about the vaccine? Do you have any information about its availability? Well, what I can say is I've had the vaccine, the first one. <laughs> um, uh, I'm fine. I'm got, I have my second one coming up on February 1st. It was Moderna. Um, it was quick. And I can tell you also that um, our county is really vamping up the process uh, to start on the next year. Um, our, we do have a, an outreach group that is putting together a presentation specifically for vaccinations. Um, and I'm hoping to have them present to you hopefully on the 28th. Um, I think that was the next date available. Uh, they will give you all the information. Uh, Debbie, do you have anything that maybe a particular note? In I don't know if she heard me. Are you on Debbie? Doesn't seem okay. like it. Okay, here, here hey, I go. Hi. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, you know, I, I don't know much yet. I actually am, this is my last week in locations because I'm moving over to the vaccination branch and then I will start to know more. Um, and we do have a presentation coming um, from someone who's in the communication area of vaccines. So it's all forming right now. I can tell you that they're opening up multiple sites around the county and we're still in phase, I believe it's uh, phase 1B still, mm -hmm. where it's, it's county staff, any patient facing staff, that kind of thing in the county. But we're rapidly trying to move into um, going to the, the general public. And I, everything I'm hearing nationally is that the big push is 65 and older and any sensitive occupations. And I think teachers and preschools fall into that. Um, but we just don't have the, the timeline yet. They are working on it. I think we will hear soon, relatively soon. Um, no. But the, we're opening up three centers, right? Two more centers right now. DVC has been um, in place for the county staff, and but they're all going to be staffed up. So within, I think, a few weeks, it's going to start moving. Okay. 
and I'm putting the uh, vaccine website uh, from our county on the chat group for you. you so know, we'll come on that one. <laughs> do you know if if you're in the one A to one B group by age, the county, the state just lowered the age to 65 from 75. So mm -hmm. for those of us older folks who fall into that category, can we go to the county? Do we need appointments? Um, I think you're going to need an appointment. And so far, the way they've been doing it is you're signing up online. I don't believe it's open and available yet to everybody, um, to even the 65 plus, because we're working on getting the sites open so we can do it. Um, but I mean, really within a week, I think there'll be more information on that. It just, I just, we don't have it yet today. And does it matter if you're a, you have private insurance or Kaiser insurance or whatever? No, it doesn't matter at all. They'll take your insurance, your insurance okay. information, they'll bill the insurance. And um, so, yeah, it's all taken care of. Okay. Michelle, I would ask you along with the question about the vaccine, you said you got it. Any side effects, Any anything you can share about actually getting it? Well, uh, I was really actually surprised, not a, a side effect. I, I get migraines um, and I, it's, we've been pretty stressed out in our at our, uh, our uh, program. So I did get a headache the next day, uh, a migraine the next day, but I associate it with my stress because I know myself and when I get stressed and some of the things that occur. But otherwise, uh, I don't know, for those of you, you probably had a tetanus shot. Yeah. And it felt just like that. So my arm was in pain for about three, three and a half days, a little swelling, a little redness. I have high blood pressure as well. So I was expecting um, some, 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 something from it, but I did not have uh, any side effects. So I was, I was ready for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I also had it and I just had a really sore arm. I will say my arm was really sore, um, but that maybe just a slight fatigue, but so slight that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like maybe, and, and that was it. They do say the second dose is harder. So but well worth it. You you want to do it. You you just want to. I, I can't wait to be past that part and feel some more comfort levels. So, but it wasn't bad. We both had Moderna. Mm -hmm. I was and, able to get it. Also, um, there was several of us that were able to get it through um, a partnership that our Head Start partners had. And um, I had an extremely sore. I got it on Monday. Extremely sore arm. Like mm -hmm. it starting in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. But seriously, I woke up this morning with like, oh, it's gone. <laughs> and that was all I had. Um, we had a couple people with a rash and one person, she just feels really sick. Mm -hmm. But she feels really sick with every single vaccine she gets. Oh, so okay. It's pretty normal. Yeah. 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 I think I feel more with the flu shot than I did with this one. Oh. Yeah. Oh, Same here. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully knock on wood for y'all. Uh, I'll let you know about the second one. <laughs> Um, it does right away give you some peace of mind, though. Not that you're, everybody needs to wear a mask. We need to continue that and keep distancing. But it just, it feels so much better. It feels a little freeing from all the worry that we've had. Do you, yeah. do either of you, do either of you have any information about immunity after the first or second vaccine? Do we know yet? I have heard nothing. Uh, about how protective it is and how quickly it's protective. Yeah, I did read an article. So they believe it's at least 50% effective within about 10 days, 10 to 14 days. And uh, then I read an article that they, with the Moderna, um, they did a very, very small group um, they looked at and they were actually, um, it was up to 90% effective in that, mm -hmm. that very, very small group. So that, you know, they, they need to do a lot more than that to be sure. But um, so it's, it really is effective. You get that second um, shot when you get it, it, it activates your memory cells, right? Your memory immune system. So then it remembers what it's seen. So it's, it, that's how they get it up to that very high effectiveness up to 95%. So, um, so that's, that's all we know. I would, I would say I would count on the 50%. So someone just asked if you got documentation to prove you were vaccinated, how are people going to verify that they've been vaccinated so they can go back to work um, if jobs require the vaccination? Mm -hmm. um, so you do receive a, um, 
CDC vaccination mm -hmm. card. And uh, actually, um, if you don't mind, I can go get it real quick. Oh, yeah, Carol Carter just put it up. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Carol there you go. Screen. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. So you you will get a card, and they put on the first date of your vaccination and second date. Thank you, Carol. Um, and so you will have that kind of like when you do. We I don't know if they still give Debbie if they still give out the immunization cards, but uh, this one is a CDC card. Yeah, I don't see those anymore, but they're handy to have because they are. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention that I emailed my doctor at Kaiser about a week and a half ago and said, I'm 1B, I just want to be proactive. And she immediately said, I'm going to send your information off to the vaccine team. And four days later, on a Saturday, I got a call from Kaiser and said, when do you want the shot? And I said, as soon as possible. However, I was literally the only non-Kaiser member or worker that was in the vaccine clinic. So somehow I got pushed through, but all of my teachers that are Kaiser are like pushing on their doctors, put me through to the vaccine team, put me through to the vaccine team. Um, and one got pushed through already. So she doesn't have a date yet. Hmm. But I think that if, I, I know with Kaiser, if you're proactive, right? The squeaky wheel. Yeah. I would say push. Yeah, I Where's your Where's your Kaiser at, Carol? Where Where did you go through? I I did I, my to push Lins and he pushed me back. I know, but we just my teacher's pushing, and she got sent off to the vaccine team. Um, I'm I'm my doctor's at Shadelands in Walnut yeah. Creek, but I drove out to Antioch. I said, "What's first available?" And they said Antioch, and I made my husband drive me because I was a little nervous about getting it. But I got it on Tuesday. I feel fine. Okay. Did you get Pfizer or Moderna? Yeah. I got Moderna. And it's just whatever the flavor of the day is, yeah. is what yeah. Kaiser said. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there, Michelle or Deborah, are there any differences that you know of? Or do you Not just, should we be grateful for what we can get? <laughs> That's <laughs> how I look at it. <laughs> oh, I, I think the differences are slight. You know, there are just some slight differences with um, Moderna. It's four weeks to the next the second vaccination with Pfizer at three weeks, you know, just ah. very minor. I think there were actually just a few more side effects with one, you know, possibility of, but nothing major. So yeah, we should be thankful for just to be able to get it. It really is like winning a prize. I asked if they had a sticker, you know how they have the sticker, I voted, they, they, they should have a sticker, I'm vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to remind people. Um, My husband said they're going to gonna put barcodes on our foreheads. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I hope not. <laughs> I want to remind people to read the chat box because uh, Deborah is doing a good job of writing in answers. You're, yes, you're writing is. in questions um, and the answers I, are appearing there magically. So thank, thank you, Deborah. And uh, can you get it. thank you. Can you get your first dose from one and your second dose and you have to stick to the same next one? That's a good question. Uh, Debbie, have you heard any, have you read yeah. anything on that one? Yeah, no, they do want you to stick to the same one. So it'd be very doubtful. At least at this point, things keep changing, but that is what they're saying now. Mm -hmm. So you bring your card with you for the second one to make sure you get the right one? You should, so that you can have both dates on there. Okay. Yeah, that's probably a good thing. But the way the county does it, actually for me, I went in and got my after visit summary and my second appointment was there right away. Mm -hmm. So, and then mm -hmm. they know they, they're, you know, they're tagging exactly probably that day. Everybody will get that same vaccine. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. So more to come on that uh, beautiful presentation coming from my outreach group. Good. So Michelle, stay tuned. <laughs> are you saying Michelle that your vaccine group is, is available for that January 28th date? When I talked to Heather, um, the last one is if we can reschedule for another date and I forwarded her the 28th. So when I get off our call, I'll find out. To, I haven't checked my email since. So um, I'll find out if she's okay with that date. I'll that also chat great. her, so I'll double back. It. And there's you. two people on the team, so. Uh, so do you have, do you have information? Some of the other questions that have come in is, our, our child care center licensing related. So the state, I, I'm looking at the list here, um, the state requires right now 
because of COVID, uh, single cohorts per teacher. Do you know if the vaccine will allow a teacher once vaccinated to then move between different classes of children? I'm or, not sure. That would be yeah. licensing and certification and their requirements. So okay, I yeah. think there's going to be probably the state will have to reevaluate a lot of things. Um, that, you know, because as it changes. But yeah, we we don't know anything. Yeah, because yeah. the other question related to that had to do with cohort size, the number of children per teacher, which right now is much more restricted. And I, I didn't know if that was within your purview or not, but I have to, you asked for the questions, here they That's are. Okay. Yeah, we're here. Um, I, I did receive information from my colleague that works the schools program is that right now CDPH is working on a, a new guidance for K through 12. Okay. So as soon as that comes out, I'll make sure that Margaret gets that. So do you have any information that we don't yet have on when schools might open? No, ma'am. I asked him that Loaded question as question. well. <laughs> yeah. I asked him that question as well, and he probably won't know for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I have friends who are elementary teachers who are very doubtful about schools opening in February, even though that's what Newsom is shooting for. Mount yeah. Diablo posted today that they will not open the third okay. quarter. Oh, um, yeah. Which is interesting, just so some of you know, um, I know of schools in other states that have been open. They're functioning on, with smaller class sizes or part day programs so that all children can be accommodated. And they have had no COVID cases. They're doing things right. And I wish we could learn from some of those, some of those open schools. Um, anyway, side note from me, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, um, we do work with, we, so there's two programs um, in our section. Um, we have a RCF uh, residential care facility program. We, and then we have schools and locations. Uh, so schools and locations are, there's one manager over schools and one over locations and Coco Help. Um, so, but we work with our schools program uh, right now. They uh, do K through 12. Uh, they're helping us with um, a daycare and helping us with preschools. Um, if a preschool or child care has an outbreak, then that's when it'll, it'll go back for locations to follow up. And the outbreak is still the same. Uh, it's three or more cases within a 14 day uh, period. Okay. And they should be what's what called what's called EpiLink. The easiest way to rem remember EpiLink is same place, same time. And so it's like your teachers in one cohort within a classroom, same place, same time. Okay. Yeah. Um, another question that came came up uh, as people were registering was about new testing or tracing, is that getting any better in our county? It still, it seems, can take up to four or five days to get an appointment to get tested. And then the tracing is, the results are another two to three days. Um, Let me look at our website real quick. Cause the last time I saw, uh, they were a little behind um, only because um, of everybody moving to vaccinations. Uh, so let me check our website really quick. But um, that, so it says here on our website, average recent average processing time is two days with health services, with our health services uh, testing. So it might take three, four days to get an appointment, maybe five. I'm not sure, but uh, two day turnaround okay. according to our website. So if you think you've been exposed, you should quarantine until you're tested. Well, even if you're tested, you still have to quarantine. Uh, if you test, even if you test negative, you still should quarantine for the 10 days. Hmm. Okay. Because you guys, you mentioned earlier, somebody said they got uh, symptoms on the 15th day. 15th day. Yeah. yeah. Dorothy, oh, you're muted. You're on mute, Dorothy. <laughs> and uh, Kim, Kim, yeah, my staff was tested. That staff member tested was tested two or three times, and it was negative. Fifteenth oh. day, it was positive. So now I am sticking with fourteen days, guys. 
<laughs> that, that's my rule now because the whole classroom had to she was in the classroom so we had to, to to close down that classroom so for now on it's 14 days for us <laughs> okay thank you dorothy uh, um michelle deborah early on we were told to wipe everything down and put uh, hepa filters in every classroom if we could afford them um are those precautions still i'm not hearing anything about either of those precautions mm -hmm. uh, that it's airborne that uh, super cleaning five times a day and hepa filters really are or are not making any difference what do you think I so does still cdc does uh say it's still airborne um that's one of the reasons for the masks and the social right. distancing um i'm i've read a couple articles from uh, Huan, China. Uh, they did some um, studies afterwards um, in December. And I'm reading that there was um, uh, fulmite contamination. Um, with our United States, they're still doing the studies. So they, they might not have that information for another few months. So as a precautionary, as an environmental health specialist and uh, a biologist, uh, I still tell people when you, and it still says in CDC to clean and disinfect. Uh, uh, CDPH still says clean and disinfect. So if I think for the childcare that we've been dealing with, you've been doing a really good job closing that classroom, doing either some of you have contracted with a company that's certified uh, for clo uh, deep cleaning for COVID. But otherwise, uh, you just want to uh, clean with soap and water and then rinse that, with, rinse any soap off and then use your disinfectant. The important thing is to make sure that your disinfectant is um, effective against COVID. There's one website that I'll put on right now uh, that is, it's the EPA list N. There's about 502 chemicals on there. And all those chemicals um, are what they found are effective against COVID. Um, COVID is, it's easy to kill, but you have to have the right chemical to break it down. And that's the important thing is to break it down. So going back to what I was saying, if you have a positive in a, in a cohort or a classroom, um, open the doors, get as much air from the outside as possible, turn on your HVAC system, get the air circulating, uh, clean soap and water, wipe off that soap, use your disinfectant. I saw some of you were using hydrogen peroxide. That's a good one. Uh, Clorox wipes, that's a good one. Um, all hot spots, especially your door handles, especially the restrooms, as much as you can in the restrooms, um, the toys, other, I, the last meeting we had, I sent out um, a um, CDC uh, link for how to sanitize, clean and sanitize toys. Um, uh, your hand wash stations, I saw some of you had uh, hand wash stations in the classroom itself, so those areas. Your, uh, if you're using cots, you want to make sure any metal areas on the cot. Um, uh, launder, all bedding so i know you provide pillows and blankets all bedding so anywhere that you would look around in a room where does a child go touch stay where does a teacher go touch stay make sure you wipe those down usually it depends on your chemical but the most important thing is the word contact time contact time is the amount of time that chemical has to sit there and just just let it work just let that chemical attack the virus and any microbe and bring it down to a safe level um, so usually if it's bleach or um, um, it's about a minute to three minutes hydrogen peroxide is pretty quick i've seen that about a minute to two minutes if you're using um, uh, quaternary ammonia that one is usually virex um, uh, Lysol, uh, I'm trying to think of other, but if you see ammonia chloride on the ingredients, the active ingredients, that's usually quaternary ammonia, that can range up to 10 minutes. So make sure you contact time. And then you can reoccupy the room. But the better that you air out the room, the best that, that you can get. Yeah. Uh, someone asked about a hydrostatic sprayer. Uh, 
So those are really cool uh, if you're able to get it. <laughs> um, that, again, I think with that one, it is a, um, a Clorox product uh, that, that's used with that. And I have a picture of it somewhere. Um, I'll, I'll tell about it. Huh? I said, I have one if you want me to talk about it. Yeah, yeah, that would be great because those are actually really cool. I've seen those in casinos. They walk around and spray. <laughs> but the important part of that is you always have to clean is I'll give you a presentation that I gave to uh, uh, school uh, janitorial services. It's at the end of the presentation, it talks about cleaning versus dis versus sanitizing versus disinfectant. Okay, Kalud, put it up again. Kalud is just putting up a, the Lysol product. Okay. So if you want to take a look, it looks like a blue to purple cap and a nice spray can. Well, I know that one. So that's a quaternary ammonia. Um, and the most Lysols are effective, effective against uh, COVID. Uh, you just want to make sure they know the contact time. And that one, well, that's the name Dorothy of the company. Stewart also put one up. That's a serious thing, Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was, I was so, well, you know, you guys, if you know me, I know how freaked yes. out the whole thing. But yeah, no, uh, we first paid a service to the electrostatic spring and it was enormously expensive. It was going to be, cheaper to buy one and it and they cost a lot of money but they're down I think this one was a, the new ones are about eighteen hundred dollars oh wow yeah no I know it really is but well, then, Lysol can is substantially easier to get and use but I don't know if it's as well, well the, what the thing about yeah, go ahead you tell I was gonna tell them what it does you go oh, no you go ahead I want you to show it off <laughs> right. oh I don't I don't off your toy there Brenda I don't know where the, I don't know where the hose is so you put it in there and you spray it and it's supposed to get under stuff and around stuff. So it's not like just on the top of the surface. It'll go under the bookshelves and around the toy. So that's what, you know, that's what appealed to me about it. Cause I never felt like the teachers were gonna go in, nook and cranny in the school or behind every toy. So that's why we got that, so. Yeah, um, I, I did get one. I just want, my question was, is it, it, they're okay to use, right? <laughs> I got the same that you have, Dorothy, but I got the handheld one just so mm -hmm. it's like less weight on the teachers and they can, after we close every night, and then go down. Yeah. So especially get on the blocks and you day. don't like soak them. Yes, right. So you each use it once a day at the end of the day? We Well, we don't use We use it every other day, actually. Every other day. Every other day. Um, and... Um, and so what do we put Benefec in it, which I think is the least abrasive or whatever uh, thing, but also very expensive. It's just been, you know, the uh, the money that we get, the grant money that we get usually goes to this thing. Um, so it was very expensive, but we use Benefec in it. And so they can go right in afterwards, but it's, you know, it's an expensive proposition. It is, but I feel better. I feel a little safer. Um, Good. That and the the electrostatic basically, yeah, it creates a charge. Yes. So with, with Lysol, it's just a spray. So mm -hmm. wherever the chemical goes, it sticks. But with electrostatic, it creates a charge on the chemical so that it actually sticks yes. uh, closer to the microbes. Yes. Um, so it yes. creates a charge between the two microbes. So that's why they're expensive. <laughs> This is because yeah. it's broken and I'm getting another yeah. part. That's yeah. <laughs> but they're actually really good. Um, so good job on that. And if you like, if you want to send, uh, I think it was Brenda and Dorothy. Um, if you want to send me, it sounds like Benefit. I think that's a hydrogen peroxide, which is one of the better ones. That's probably why it's so expensive too. Um, but if you want, you can send me those too and I can take a look. But um, I've heard that name before. Let me say something. So my daughter just texted me and said, oh, over 65 can get the vaccine in Contra Costa County now. So I just Googled it, Contra Costa COVID vaccine over 65. And there actually is a link right away, top story from NBC, and they have a link to sign up. So that's that's all I can tell you right now, but um, get, get on there and look and, and get yourself signed up. I put a telephone number down to call that will also give you the link on the chat. Yeah, I, wrote, I wrote that down right away. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, there are a couple more questions that have popped up in the chat. One, going back a little bit, 
Uh, Claire asked, because you mentioned toys and cleaning them, what about soft things like dress up clothes, um, boas, hats, and stuffed animals, high heel shoes, those kinds of things? Um, they be avoid the boas. <laughs> Just for now, avoid the boas uh, because they're hard to clean. Uh, you have to be able to launder. Um, soft toys can be laundered. Um, it, you want to make sure, what I've seen with some daycare, which I thought was a gr very innovative in the beginning of this, is uh, they would put the child's toys in plastic containers. So only that child would use use those toys but I've, I've learned I don't have kids sorry everybody <laughs> but I have learned that uh, they, they will share toys no matter what yeah um, so if you have uh, cloth toys you're going to need to launder those every day um, okay. uh, yeah so that's the problem with soft that. materials huh yeah. okay so going back to chemicals and how to deal with the virus two questions have come up um, about somebody mentioned hydrogen peroxide. Michelle, mm -hmm. I think you did. Do you dilute it or use it full strength? It depends on the chemical. So always read the instructions on how to use that particular chemical. Each chemical is different. Um, so for example, if you bought bleach from the store, um, 100 parts per million, which is the minimum for uh, microorganisms, um, is if you at uh, one gallon and you use one of those blue caps, of, of uh, the chlorine in there, the bleach, that would make that would make 100 parts per million. If you have, and using again straight bleach from the store, don't use uh, scented. Scented brings down the percentage of the concentration. So just use plain old bleach. Um, one capful, 100 parts per million. If you have a COVID case and you want to use bleach, especially for your restrooms, your um, your hard surfaces like your uh, hand sinks, uh, if you have metal, um, 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 I, can't, I think of the word, but if there's metal on your cots for that, for those particular areas, um, you want to go to two capfuls because that'll get you about five, 500 uh, parts per million, which is good for COVID. Okay. Um, also, if I can add, um, it's even funny, uh, talk, uh, I've had a few presentations from environmental health side. Uh, I never thought about the material itself that you're using to to uh, to use this infection about, but you don't want to use cotton um, towels or cotton wiping uh, materials. If you can try to use more absorbent like the um, what's it called uh, microfiber uh, that we, that we would use maybe for our mops, that holds the chemical better. So you you'll see that with with a cotton material, uh, the chemical kind of seeps through, but with the other uh, more absorbent material, it kind of sits there. So. Okay, good. Kalud, you had a question? Yes, uh, what I have been using in my child care, this fogger machine. Oh, nice. Bought from Look at you guys. And I use it twice a day, <laughs> one uh, in the afternoon when we get them outside before nap time, uh, and one end of the day. But I put this in it. I hmm. can't see that, but that, that, that looks like it might be bleach. Oh wait, hydrogen peroxide it says? No, it's a uh, oh. alcohol, 70%. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, oh. alcohol is another one. So is this on a long term going to hurt the children or no? No, uh, alcohol, chlorine, hydrogen peroxide evaporates quickly. So especially when you're airing out the room, that helps in the uh, breakup of that chemical to to not only just uh, attack that microorganism, but also to leave that space. And then I wear the mask and the shield so to protect myself too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. gloves. You oh. want to make sure with gloves. Oh, okay. Yeah. We want to keep our hands, <laughs> especially yeah. with bleach and, and alcohol and hydrogen peroxide. And our clothing. Um, and our so clothing. <laughs> And someone asked about microban. That sounds familiar. Um, I'd have to look at that. If you want to send me that name via email, I can look at it, but that name sounds familiar. It's in the chat. I don't know if you can see it from Rosario Ibarra and I have no idea what microban is, so I can't help here. Okay, so we, we checked in, we have some microban. 
what scare we do use it on like door handles and things like that but it says not to use it on counter services so that made me a little nervous uh, uh, okay uh, uh, but it was supposed to last for 48 days is it something like that okay it's supposed to last for 48 days so we do use it like on the in coming in the door handles and things like that but we don't want it on the tables where the kids might eat off of so yeah yeah, if it's, uh, I have to look and to see what the chemical is. Um, if it says not to use in particular areas, please don't. Um, I'll have to look more into it. I'm, there's a lot of information on it. So let me get back to you on that one. I have it on my screen, but uh, let me get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, another question that's come up is, is about TB. And Brenda, I'm not understanding what you're asking. No, actually, it's not about TB. It's one of the disinfectants. It's a quat disinfectant. Is TB quat? Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's a weird name. Would, so. uh, I'll have your TB test. <laughs> I was just taking it directly from the bottles. <laughs> yeah. uh, quaternary ammonia. There are different companies that supply quaternary ammonia. Um, so. Yeah, you just want to make sure that it. Um, that it's part of that list and and actually let me uh, put that on now so I can if you want um, let me just get this up real quick there's a, like I said 500 chemicals so it could be one of those but the most important thing um, especially for child care if it does not come with what's called a SDS a safety data sheet make sure to have the safety data sheet and you can ask the chemical, or you can ask the uh, chemical chemical company for that, or you can go online to get the chemical the uh, safety data sheet. Uh, let's see. It it did come with that. Okay, good. So on that safety data sheet, and I put the list in on the chat now. It's usually toward the bottom, and it'll say EPA, uh, and then it'll say EPA number. Uh, registration number. That's the number that you can look up to see whether it's on list N. Okay. All right. So other questions or comments you want to? Um, so I, in the beginning of our the chat, um, the two top links uh, as of a, November 30th, 2020, uh, Cal OSHA put out a new uh, uh, regulation basically called Title VIII in regards to employers reporting t um, information not only to their employees but to Cal OSHA and to the health department. And then uh, January 1st, 2021, CDPH, um, the new law AB 685 uh, also was implemented. What they have in common is uh, outbreak reporting. So as I mentioned, um, when you have three or more cases within a 14 day period, you now are required to report that, which you have, um, you guys have been great on that, um, report that to um, the local health department. We at locations and schools are the local health department representative for you. Um, so you would just let us know. And what we ask for is how many cases you have, uh, the name of the cases, um, and for you, it's pretty much, I think, more specific. If you can say um, cohort room, a uh, cohort one, room three, that helps us a lot. Um, because what's good about uh, the daycare is that you're, you're in a spot, not like, um, uh, what are we dealing with now, um, another location where there's people going to multiple floors and staying in multiple areas for that contact time. So that's very difficult. So uh, for you, you're a little bit easier for us. <laughs> um, and uh, we, will be, we will help you through the process. We will guide you the whole way. We'll give you as much information as possible and answer your questions. So we have uh, investigators that are assigned to each um, case that we receive. Okay. Okay. And I put those two, two links in the chat for you. You also mentioned earlier AB 
685. Mm -hmm. and that was the second link um, on the top of the chat. Okay, I have a question that might put you on the spot, but it, it's me and do you think centers and child care facilities, early childhood ed facilities should require the vaccine of their teachers? What if people refuse to take it? Well, they refuse, they refuse. Yeah, there's no requirement. The only requirement is just to offer it, especially if you have an outbreak. So would you personally have a teacher working in your center who was not vaccinated and then floating from class to class as we open up? I, I can't answer that one. <laughs> uh, that's totally up to you and your guidance. Uh, it seems like you all have pretty similar guidance. And what, I, what helped us a lot is that you've been very cautious. So when you're creating your policy on that, take a look at that 685, the one I gave you specifically. Um, and the Title VIII, because it does says you are required to offer, but they, the employee can refuse. And it doesn't say in there particularly, if an employee refuses, there's consequences, consequences. It doesn't say that the employee can refuse. I think I would consider whether to allow them to float. That's the one piece. You don't have oh. to let them float. Um, and and that I know that's restrictive for your daycare. So it's it's just something to think about. I think that could be more of a problem. All right, so I'm gonna throw it out to you. all of the folks who are here with I, us today. I Anyone can speak willing about to have an opinion on that question? I, I think uh, Brenda was Title first. Yeah. Brenda, you wanna start and then Dorothy? Yeah. In the Title Five group, we've been having this conversation quite a bit and um, basically um, the consensus is you could put it in your policy just like you could put it in a policy that they have to have the flu shot whether even though it's a choice with licensing or whatever you can make it a center policy um in my discussion with my board and, and my feelings on it especially because we did just have the opportunity to have it um by chance is since it is an emergency release of the vaccine we are really not sure of long-term effects or, or even really how well it's going to work, right? So my thought is sign off a waiver. Basically, I'm choosing not to get it. I know the, the benefits of it that, that have been, I've been counseled on it and I'm choosing not to get it the same way they do a flu decline and not requiring it unless the licensing turns around and requires it. That's think, my... Thank you. Okay. And I think, Debbie, there's a... Um, I know um, other locations, uh, declination, is it called, De Debbie? Um, yeah, well, that's that's what we do. You can yeah. find to get the flu shot, but then you have to wear the mask for the rest of any patient-facing um, contact. Um, of course, we're all wearing masks, even with this vaccine. So it's, it's just, it becomes a little more restrictive. You have to think of ways to keep people safe, I think. Okay, Dorothy, did you want to add in? Yeah, well, I know that the Child Care Law Center is working on this to give us all some guidance. So I know that some guidance will be coming out. Uh, but I'm stuck to just like you guys are, because I mean, there, as you as you all know, I mean, there are two, there are two sides to it. Um, we are also liable, and I, if our if if we have a teacher that works for us has it and passes it on too. I mean, those are all issues to think about too. It goes both ways. It's very complicated. I'm hoping that the child care law center will give us some more guidance. Um, I'm just starting off. We have an in service tomorrow, just trying to convince them. We've got a doctor coming on. We've got a teacher, uh, a director getting a shot in front of them. We're just gonna like, you know, try and, get, you know, you want this so that we don't have to go there with anybody. Uh, but there is, a, but I know the Child Care Law Center is considering it. And I think at first blush, they said, yes, it's your school, you can enforce it. But we all know how hard it is to find good staff and how likely are we gonna say, well, no, you know, you're fired. You can't come in when we're so stuck. So um, so all those things have to figure into it. But at least I think there's there, there's some thought about this for us at a, a different level. So. Yeah, yeah, something to consider. Mm -hmm. Any Anyone else wanna share a thought? Claire? Unmute, hun. Sorry, I just, is there a way 
to ask that the guidance include both scenarios, like vaccinated staff, like if we're looking for another county guidance or state guidance, um, that we're all going to follow that's going to be reflective of vaccines being possible. Can they delineate in that this is what a vaccinated teacher can do in terms of cohort groups? This is what an unvaccinated teacher can do. I know one of the problems through this whole thing is that we all feel like you know, we're recreating the wheel every day. And, and this is, this group has been invaluable, this group. And then that email group, that's part of kind of organically came out of DVC. And we've all done a great job of supporting each other, but it's always so disheartening when something comes down from a higher level that hasn't really thought through Right. All the way. So that would be super helpful to me if somebody from on high could say, you know, if you're not vaccinated, this is the scenario. And if you are, this is the scenario. Yeah, my thinking on that, that might come from the licensing certification yeah. specifically for child care. Yeah. They yeah. might take what CDPH does overall and then license and certification might break it down even more for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it is in the domain of licensing to require uh, TB testing, to require other documentation for anyone that we hire as, a, as directors and owners. And I'm guessing that eventually it will come through from licensing too regarding this. But knowing how state agencies work, that could be a year or more down the road with much discussion to come. Hopefully not. Hopefully uh, working. I know CDPH is working on that other guidance. So hopefully some work, hope, at least within the next few months so that they have something for you. <laughs> right. Doesn't that guidance that's linked from the state site, that's not a licensing guidance. Mm -mm. That's a public health guidance. Right? Correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. And what, what school district, what I'm hearing is that school districts are requiring vaccinations of children, um, I'm not sure about staff and this the in again for those of you that know me I have a granddaughter who's in a private school in New York City and it goes to eighth grade and they have been in full swing open completely but with small class sizes since August um, and their teachers they are requiring They've always required masks. They require hand washing. My granddaughter's four. She's had a mask on since March and done fine, by the way. Okay. Um, but teachers are now required to be vaccinated to continue to teach. So that's why I asked it, uh, wondering what we're going to do here. We seem to be a step behind what New York is doing. So they're, they're a guidance for me. Um, yeah. I just read an article that mentioned exactly what Joan just said, but they're doing it in LA County. They're going to require their students to be vaccinated prior to going back to school. Hmm. Now, it uh, didn't reference anything about what Joan said in terms of the staff or the teachers, but um, I think LA County would be a good reference for somebody to reach out to them to see what they're doing and how they're going to do it. They might have obviously different facilities and what have you, but if that's what their requirement is, and they're the largest school, one of the largest school districts, I think, in the nation. So they might be onto something. I don't know. Um, California tends to be a, a trend-setting state along with Texas and New York. So I think reaching out to them would be a valuable um, resource, especially since we're in the same state. Right. Do you know, and I would think that if children are going to be required, uh, that teachers would definitely be required. But do you know the age level that LA is requiring? Because well, you know, the thing is the vaccine Pfizer is only for 16 and older and Moderna is for 18 and older. There's been no studies on children. So I don't think, I, I, they probably can't require them to have the COVID vaccine, other vaccines for sure. Mm -hmm. Because it, it hasn't even been studied at all. They have they've not tried it at all on children. Mm -hmm. so. I also am not convinced that what LA County is publishing is being put into well, I don't want to speak out of turn. I have a teacher who 
has two relatives who work in Los Angeles area, one of them for the county and one of them in a private center. And um, they are not following the protocols that this group is following. Hmm. There's definitely a lot of coloring outside the lines happening mm -hmm. there. Interesting. Yeah, so more to come. Hopefully by the end of the month, we'll have a lot more information for you. Um, and again, there's going to be a special vaccine, including uh, Debbie's, who's going to be part of that team in vaccinations. But for outreach, um, they'll have a lot more information, up-to-date information for you. I say just start talking to your staff now. Like, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm hoping to do. To convince there you go, Dorothy. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a low, slow process. Took us a long time to get and feel good about coming back. We did a lot of training on that. So now we're just going to roll it out and do it about vaccinations. And you, you know, and as I mentioned before, you guys have been doing a really good job. Thank you. <laughs> I'm extremely proud to be part of this early childhood community. I think uh -huh. it's amazing. And the emails I see going around and what I hear from Coco Kids people is it, it just makes me proud to be in this county. Let's give you guys your uh, a clap on yours for yourselves definitely definitely um, <laughs> you guys are hand this up yes question so if i i check the uh, contra costa public health 1b is not there yet okay. uh, but if if it's gonna be there uh, should i take my license with me and this is the approved and how about my assistance my assistant's name is not in the license it's just me and my husband so me and my husband can get it, but what should I, what proof I should give to my assistant so they could go and get it? I, uh, Debbie, I think you probably will be a little more, but I, when I took it, um, they didn't even look for my Contra Costa Health Services yeah. badge. So they might not ask you that. Um, yeah, I think when you sign up, they ask you which category you fall yeah. into. And they, they ask you, it says, I certify, what is I just see under penalty. I'm not sure if it's that under penalty, but that's how they want you to certify. Oh, she has it on the. On the yeah, okay. well, it's, this is this is what's the requirement: age 75, 60, or age 65, and then if you are doctors, nurses, whoever. So it's all there, but our our category is not there yet, and I'm keep uh, pushing with my Kaiser doctor. Unfortunately, she's pushing me back. This is the fourth time that I email her, and she said, "No, no, no, no. It's not your turn. It's not your turn." Yeah, you're Although right. I have a heart disease, but she also pushing me. Uh, anyway, so it's, uh, but when if it's available for us, the licensing certificate, my license is only the thing uh, I have mm -hmm. to prove that I'm working with children. Yeah. I would, uh, if you know, if you want right. to, I would check the website daily or every other day because things are moving fast for us. Yeah, I mean, we're just losing put up that 65. So, yeah. so listen, I mean, it does say here, it says, um, I attest that I meet the eligibility criteria for and then you check one of them. And it says you proof may be required. I mean, I'd probably just write a letter for them. And oh, say, that's oh, right. Okay, that's, that's, good. Okay, yeah. that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. 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 Or something from the school with her name. Mm hmm. You know, as an, a good, agent, as an assistant. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? I hope we were able to answer as best as we could today. Sorry, we couldn't answer more about vaccinations, but more to come. Um, come farther <laughs> than we were, and that's amazing. Um, I'm looking for hands up or people waving at me. Anyone else want questions or I have, comments? Joan, I have one question. This is Miley. Hi, Miley. Hi, Miley. Hi everyone. Um, so I had a question quickly about um, if we have children or a child that uh, needs assistance in the classroom, whether it's from an aide or um, an outside provider, are, I'm looking through all of the guidance to see, is that allowable? That would mean that there would be three adults in the classroom. So our two teachers plus um, their personal aid. Mm -hmm. Is that something as long as the number does not exceed 16 total, so 14 plus 2, is that it? Or exactly. Three plus, okay. Keeping that 16 and, total in mind. Yeah. Okay, great. And then to go back to the question, I know Jonah had, had asked you this question before. When I was just, um, looking in, and the website that I'm on is the California Department of Public Health website with cohorts. Uh, under considerations for staff, it does say that teachers for children under the age of five years, we can have 
a, a teacher can teach in two cohorts, and that's the guidance that I've been following. Is that different from licensing? That's for Joan. Um, my or for anybody is one cohort per adult, not two. So you're nope. reading something I'm not fully aware mm -hmm. of. Others yeah, are cohorts are okay. A teacher can float between two cohorts. What's the um, the, the date on the that? website? Mm -hmm. Oh, the uh, let's see. The date on this is this is California Department of Public Health, and the date is September fourth, twenty twenty. Okay, because our most recent one I put up earlier. Uh, if I, let me check the chat real quick. I so put that that I have not yet seen mm -hmm. or heard about. And, and they have had possible. Possible. <laughs> well, sorry. So uh, I can read it just so that everyone can understand. Um, it says considerations for staff supervising adults should be assigned to one cohort, must solely work with that cohort unless serving children five years of age and younger, in which case an adult may be assigned to no more than two cohorts. Okay, so that's that's new from summer, definitely. And to me, that I think you're I think you're reading it right that then a teacher with children under the age of five can be involved with two cohorts wow. up to a maximum of 14 children or 16 total um, makes a cohort. Yeah, let me take a look at that because I know there's some new guidance as a, as as a new guidance as of. Um, I think it was October. I have to say I personally that makes me a little nervous I would probably stick with one teacher per cohort but that's me following the guidelines is what you're required to do so yeah one thing to keep in mind and she and Joan is right on that um at least for the experience with outbreaks um a couple outbreaks we had we had teachers who and aides that were going from a class to class. Um, it wasn't the child. The child was in the same cohort. It was a teacher going from class to class. So that's something to keep in mind that when you have movement, you have a higher risk of a spread. Yeah, it's, it's the adults that are the concern. And if I think about nursing facilities where someone's delivering lunch to people in individual rooms, where you typically have huge outbreaks is that aid delivering the meals is the one who's spread it all over <laughs> so the fewer adults per group in terms of mixing groups is what makes me personally feel safe but again you're right in reading the guidelines so can you send that to me because I, no, I don't have that one do you mind sending that one to me or put it in the chat really can you type the sure i am um, i'm looking at my computer but i'm on my ipad so i okay. might do you have Michelle? Or, can you chat your email and I can? Yeah, it or if you want to give it to Margaret, um, and then she can send it. I to have. Uh, let's see. I can give it to Joan. Joan, I have your email, so I'll, I'll um, shoot it to you. Okay. All right. And All right. Uh, that was a good scenario to bring up because that. Um, uh, one question I think some from somebody was there new guidance, especially about masks. And I could not find any new guidance. I asked my colleague that runs the school program and he could not find any new guidance. Um, I, still, I still see the children under 12 and the two year old, but I don't see anything in particular that's new. So if you see uh, anything new, especially for licensing and certification, um, that would be greatly appreciated to share because I'd look into that. Michelle, really quick, is it still recommended though for the two year old and um and up for the mask for outside? Because I know there's a back and forth when it comes to two-year-olds and um, playing them. outside. Yeah. So that was one of the things I was looking at. And it's still, uh, from what I saw, wearing masks. And if they're healthy enough, if they're in good health, um, that they can wear it. And outside, you're, it's pretty much it's a, it's a lower risk. Um, the thing is, is that they're playing, they're exhausting more, they're um, aspirating more. So even though they're outside, they're still playing in the same environment. And, and you know children better than I is that they're close. Um, they're running down the slide together. They might be sharing um, the swing. They're in close contact. So I think that's the risk for out, outdoors. Oh, wait, I have a question about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The travel restriction, and we're going crazy with this, parents 
who's, who keep arguing with us, it's okay to go to Tahoe and go skiing. <laughs> um, <it's> well, <laughs> <laughs> and then that's part of your guidance. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the CDPH travel guidance uh, advisory, actually. Um, and I'll put that on there after too. The word, there's two words on there. The for number one, it says the word should. Mm -hmm. uh, you should not travel. The word yeah. should is not a directive word. It does not say must, does not say shall. Right. Yeah. So that's where it's up to you to make it stronger. Yeah. The second word is highly recommended, not do not. So again, that's for up to you and to make your guidance stricter if you'd like to. Well, I do. I'm always making my guidance stricter, but yeah. I'm arguing, they're arguing with me that if they're skiing, they're not in danger. I guess that's the question. <laughs> what are your thought about that? Because that, that's what I'm getting back to daily. <laughs> Well, from what I remember about skiing is also going into the fireplace and enjoying time <laughs> near the fire. So, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're not always masks. Um, yeah. So you're still spending time, especially if there's multiple people, uh, multiple households uh, coming together. Your risk is high. My understanding yeah. is all the huts are closed. All the snack bars are closed. Okay. So people have to bring their own food. Uh, but they could, choose to, they could choose to get on uh, a chairlift with another person that is not part of their, or they can try to get on one alone. Right. But you're, they're thinking they're outside. Right. So they're far away. You don't right. think so, Carol? The open, Margaret. The food what? is open. The food is open. The concessions are open. Okay. Not the ones I heard about. I saw. <laughs> Uh, I, I know this is really a privileged question of parents of privilege. Yes. This is what my constant argument is. <laughs> I was like, and no, I you also, can't go to Tahoe, go I ski. also heard that the Tahoe area is now open. Yes, it oh, is. That Sacramento Tahoe yesterday. is open, so you can travel there. Somebody has a rental there, and now they could, you know, go to their rental. Yes. So anyway, I'll struggle through that. Those poor parents. <laughs> Well, I just put the travel guide and the travel advisory on the chat for you. Okay, okay, yeah. all right, thank you. And again, when you're reading something, um, must is a directive, shall is a directive. Uh, so those are the words you want to look for, for actually you have to do. All right, uh, can we have about nine minutes, anything else? Anything that you want to talk about or um, again, we hope to work with you more in the future. I know the biggest one right now is uh, vaccinations. Uh, Debbie's going to be going in there and has, we'll have more information, but we do have a team that's going to be providing you more information. Um, we at locations and schools, are, we are a team with you. Um, please continue to uh, work with your, if you already have um, a case and you're working with our uh, locations investigator, uh, please continue to. If you have questions, I'm going to put um, in the chat right now. We uh, it's covid.business.tracing at cchealth.org. Um, so you can email questions to that. Um, our subject matter experts, myself and another supervisor, answer those answer those emails every day. Um, so please feel free to contact us anytime. And we have got, gotten questions, really good questions from you. So uh, we also learn from you. <laughs> so please continue to do so. Um, just remember, you're a team and we're here to be a team with you. That's fabulous, Michelle. We thank you so much. And Deborah, you too. Debbie, you too.